any symptoms of an illness and not necessarily the way you should feel. Well, I guess if you could believe that. But you're tending not to believe. I'm having some trouble in my spiritual beliefs right now. So when you're depressed, everything looks bleak. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, I was totally hopeless, but I don't feel that way today. <laughs> well, it's nice to see you today. Mm -hmm. Thank how, you. How are you doing? It's scary when you've got it all bottled up inside and you're afraid to talk. And then when you do talk, you feel like it's bouncing back in your face and that you've said it all wrong. And yesterday, my thoughts were so muddled that I felt like that you were doing all the talking and I was just saying yes and no, pretty much. And um, today, I feel like I've been able to express myself better. This patient's extreme mood change took place over a mere 24 hours. It was induced by depriving her of sleep for one night and day. The jolt to her brain sleep clock forced her change in mood. It shows how resetting the time of sleep can result in a startling realignment of behavior. reason I want to show you that is this is an experimental treatment, sleep deprivation therapy, and uh, it, it, in about a third of people with unipolar depression and almost 60 percent of people with bipolar depression, if you uh, deprive somebody of sleep for one night, you get this dramatic uh, improvement and the depression goes away. And tip, tip, when it works, it typically lasts for one or two days and then they slip back down into depression. But I, I want to show you this in this context because what's happening here is you're doing something that is giving a jolt to the circadian rhythm, and you get this marked mood change like this. Unfortunately, uh, if the person's bipolar, it also can do what? What do you think it could do? Trigger what? Trigger yeah, you got it. You got it. Uh, the promise of sleep deprivation therapy is that if you can rule out uh, bipolar disorder, and you start somebody on treatment for unipolar depression with antidepressants and psychotherapy and hopefully things like exercise also, is to use sleep deprivation during the first couple of weeks to give them some symptomatic improvement. And there have been case reports of that if you use this in the first two weeks, that actually antidepressants kick in and start working uh, more quickly. This is absolutely experimental. The jury is out on this, but uh, it's something I think to be watchful for. Okay. So, anyway, I'm glad I remembered to show you that. Treating acute manic episodes. For severe agitation, and sometimes these people, uh, it's not it's not that they're usually you know aggressive or violent, but they're just wildly agitated, and you've got to do something first to to calm them down. Uh, when I was uh, mopping floors in the state hospital in college, there was a guy that came in, and uh, and he's wildly manic. And they, so they put him in, in restraints. And, and this is nobody that wants to have to put somebody in physical restraints. It's just, you want to try to avoid that. But, that, but they, he was put in restraints and then uh, and given some medication. Uh, and then they said, let's try to see if we can get this guy to eat lunch. And uh, they took off the restraints and he just bolted. And he ran and he ran down to the end of the hall. And there was a concrete cinder block wall. And he just smashed head first into it and got a skull fracture. And, uh, I, you know, I didn't know for sure, but the psychiatrist said I didn't, I, this was not a suicide attempt. He was just wildly manic and out of control. And so, you know, people can inadvertently hurt themselves uh, or other patients or staff. So you've got to do something, okay? And so typically uh, the drugs that are used are uh, tranquilizers and or antipsychotics. And the combination that's used the most is Ativan, intramuscular, and Haldol. And, uh, you give you give 
this medicine and they wait a while and if it doesn't work you give them some more until it knocks them out. And, and what's interesting, this is just a little uh, uh, trivia here, back during the Civil War, long before they had any, obviously any medications for uh, treating manic episodes, obviously they had manias, uh, dating back to the time of, of Hippocrates there are uh, mentions of people becoming manic, so it's been with the human race for a long time. What they would do to treat acute mania uh, is they would get people drunk and, and they, they just make them drink lots and lots of alcohol until they passed out and then you know three or four hours later when they woke up again they give them a few more shots of uh, alcohol and they keep them asleep for three days and then when they finally woke up after three days the, the, the wild out of control agitation had quieted down. Now, of course alcohol is not good for bipolar but that was really the only thing they had that could predictably knock people out. So anything you do to get somebody to sleep is going to take the edge off of uh, edge off this wild agitation, but it's just safer to use uh, uh, tranquilizers and or antipsychotics. Now, two things. Number one, uh, alcohol is not used these days largely because HMOs won't pay for Jack Daniels, uh, and, uh, but it can make things worse. But the other thing is, if you take a look at the tranquilizers, uh, any of them can work, uh, but the one that you should never use with bipolar is Xanax. Now. You asked a question earlier about are there differences in antidepressants causing switching, okay? If you look at Xanax, Xanax is not actually technically a benzodiazepine. It's, it, it's so similar in its actions, but its chemical structure, it looks almost identical to tricyclic antidepressants. And so you give Xanax to people that have bipolar and it can make them worse. So uh, for that reason, that should be avoided. ECT can be used. Uh, it, but it's, it's very, very rare that they would uh, do that to treat acute mania. Okay. There's the Xanax thing. Uh, efficacy in treating mania. Well, if you look at group studies, I don't really think they're very helpful because everybody is, is unique. If you look at the main drugs that are used to treat, uh, there's no one in group studies you know, that stand out as, as being the leader. But what it really boils down to uh, is tolerability. And, and like, for, for instance, 30% of people just cannot take lithium. They just can't, okay? So, 